Hello and welcome to the August 1st, 2023 Select Board Meeting. The entire board is present, town manager, town clerk, a couple other members of the town government. Um, let us stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. First, we have the approval of our meeting minutes from July 18th, 2023. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? All right, first public comment. <laughs> All right, I will close the first public comment. Uh, we have no reports of committees, no department reports. We have a presentation of the amendments to the land use ordinance by Michael LaRue, Planning Board Chair. Hi, I'm Michael LaRue, Chair of the Planning Board. Um, a couple things to start off is the definition changes or adding and changes. Um, first is the automotive convenience store and gas station. It's a retail operation that provides both the sale of food and household products along with the sale of petroleum and EV charging stations for vehicular fueling. Next is gas station, an operation that provides the sale of petroleum and EV charging stations for vehicular fueling. Um, we had a change in the definition to automotive service. Um, it's just the addition of this definition excludes automotive convenience stores. Um, and then retail business, we also added this definition excludes automotive convenience stores and gas stations. Um, you can see that we added it to the table for R1 and RCI zones um, for both the automotive convenience store and gas station. Um, uh, do you want me to read through all of the... I'd just like to note that uh, where you added it, it was conditional. Conditional, yes. Yeah, sorry. And then um, we added the automotive convenience store and gas station. All the requirements for that um, can be no longer, uh, no larger than 3,000 square feet. We want uh, visual screening on three sides of the property must be fully screened at ground level to the abutting properties. All natural vegetation must be eight feet in height at, this, at the time of planting and be a minimum of two rows deep planted six feet on center. When abundant a residence, a solid privacy fence or at least five feet in height is required, a pr solid privacy fence of at least five feet in height is required in addition to the landscaping. Um, Free standing lights around the facility shall be dark sky friendly certified and on poles no taller than 15 feet. Canopy lighting for the gas pump shall not have any spillover lighting onto any abutting property or the, or the public way in which the facility is located. Automotive convenience stores shall not be affiliated with automotive service. Automotive convenience stores shall not be located any closer than a thousand feet from any other automotive convenience stores. All underground tanks must include a tank alarm system and be designed with a double wall or safer as defined by the main Department of Environmental Protection. Automotive convenience stores shall not provide any more parking spaces than required under Article 7, Section 7.8 of the Parking Standards portion of the ordinance. Filling station locations shall be counted towards the required parking requirements. Automotive convenience stores are allowed only on properties that have frontage on Route 9, 4, or 236. Operating hours are to be permitted between 4 a.m. and 10 p.m. seven days a week. Gas filling may be permitted for 24-7 operation provided all main state requirements are met. Fuel tanks and pumps are to be located no closer than 300 feet to any residential well or public water supply. Dumpsters are to have a set location. All dumpsters are to have covers and, fenced around and a fenced surround. 
Each station must comply with all state and federal regulations, including inspections. Um, then down into mixed use, we added, um, so mixed use shall meet the minimum lot size for residential use, and we added and require no further minimum lot size for any additional uses in the VC, SCI, and RCI zones. A mixed use shall meet the minimum size lot for residential use plus half the minimum lot size for each additional commercial industrial use in all other zones. Uh, for the land use district regulations, we've changed the accessory dwelling units to permits on the AP, LR, and SP zones. All right, residential growth limitation provisions. Um, we struck, struck out D and then um, F is accessory dwelling units do not count as a, as a permit issued towards the growth limitations in this section. In the accessory dwelling units, number one, we changed the accessory part, apartment shall be more than 190 square feet um, instead of 400. In the marijuana amendments, um, we updated the definition of marijuana cooperative from two to three or more medical marijuana or adult use cultivators sharing a location as a primary residence in order to conduct marijuana home production. Um, <clears throat> we also added on marijuana caregiver home production that two, two caregivers who share the same residency may both operate. We struck out the permits and um, the table and um, there we struck out the cap. Um, Next is the solar farms. Um, it was 8.37 8 and it was essential services and now it's just solar farms. Uh, we struck out that one and then we added the following requirements are additional to all other requirements of the land use ordinance to be included in the site plan and conditional use. A, a decommissioning plan signed by the party responsible for decommissioning the landowner, if different, and the state of Maine whose minimum requirements meet the standards here. B, solar farms shall be screened from view by continuous landscaping of plantings of at least six feet in height to cover any open spaces of the fencing along exterior lot lines adjacent to residential properties and all roads. The boundaries of any essential service that borders any road or any abutting lot shall consist of a pollinator buffer, the width of the required setback along that border in addition to any fence that shall be erected. Active vegetation should be used to satisfy these planting requirements where possible. No vegetation shall or fence shall interfere with a required clear sight triangle at a driveway or road intersection. Berms with vegetation are encouraged as a component of any buffer. C, the fencing shall be placed eight inches off the ground to allow for the safe passage of wildlife. A fencing, the fencing shall be gated at the access point and have a knox box located for emergency access with tree screening the remainder of the access side of the fencing. D, Provide a cost estimate for the construction of the facility as well as the decommissioning of the facility in order to establish a bond letter of credit or other form of surety for the town to hold during the construction process and for the life of the facility toward the decommissioning aspect of the project. E. Access to the site shall be a minimum of 20 foot of travel way in width. F. If lighting is provided at the site, lighting shall be shielded and downcast so that the light does not spill onto the adjacent parcel or into the night sky. Motion sensor control is required. And G, a capacity letter from Central Main Power. Next, um, on 7.4, we struck out glare and changed it to lighting struck out the beginning of that and then um, added one outdoor lighting shall not adversely impact road safety or adjacent properties and uses 
two exemptions. The following types of lighting are exempt from the standards in this subsection. A, light emitting brightness less than 1600 lumens. B, string mini lights used in window displays or in trees, bushes, and shrubs as part of the landscaping. C, lighting of approved sports facilities for the duration of events. D, short-term use, up to 60 consecutive days of lighting for public festivals, celebrations, and observance of holidays. E, lighting required and regulated by any superior legal jurisdiction. F, lighting controlled by motion-activated sensors in which limit the duration of illumination to less than five minutes after activation. And G, lighting of state, municipal, or other monuments where approved by the code enforcement officer. Three, light shielding, all lighting not otherwise exempted from this shall, A, be fully shielded, meaning fixture constructed, so that no light rays are emitted by the installed fixture, fixture at angles above 15 degrees below the horizontal plane, and also so the filament or light source is not visible to the naked eye when viewed from a higher point viewed from a higher point than the 15 degrees below the horizontal plane of the fixture. B, avoid disability glare, i.e. avoid being a hazard or nuisance to motorists, pedestrians, or neighboring residents. And C, be directed away from adjacent properties and streets, including properties separated from the development site by a street, road, or right of way so that the lighting elements are not exposed to direct view by motorists or sidewalk pedestrians or from adjacent properties. Four, uplighting is prohibited except in cases where the fixture is shielded from the sky by a roof overhang or similar structural shield and where the fixture does not extend beyond the structural shield. Five, correlated color temperature. Lighting must be chosen to minimize the amount of short wavelength light, blue light emitted into the nighttime environment using a correlated color temperature not to exceed 3,000 Kelvin. Color temperatures over 5,000 Kelvin are called cool colors, bluish, while lower color temperatures 2,700 to 3,000 K are called warm colors, yellowish. So there's that. Um, next was the Village Overlay District Additional Request of 9 Goodwin Street, U4-126, a Village Commercial Zone. Um, we approve that. Now it's to you. Um, Article 7 is we changed the fees. Um, the application fee was 200 and we changed that to 750. Um, you want, I can just read the thing, the whole paragraph. No, I think you're okay. Okay. And then, um, the, in addition, the applicant shall pay a fee instead of 250 it's 350 now per lot or dwelling unit for subdivision with 10 lots or more. And we change the 400 to 500 per lot for subdivisions with fewer than 10 lots. Okay, moving on to the design guide and standards. Um, this has been a project for a little while and now it's kind of updated. So now we're trying, we're trying to get it to be in the land use ordinance instead of just a, like a guideline, but just something that has more teeth. Um, do you want me to go through all of these? Or, okay. I want you to read every single word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um... We added the introduction. Uh, we want trying to make it more pedestrian friendly for like the downtown. This is for the village overlay district, Route Nine, Route Four, and Two Thirty Six. Um, and it's we've defined what one story is. Um, a couple other things: uh, materials, textures, and colors. Trying to show what we're kind of looking for in the new designs, um, roof shapes, um, commercial structures. We kind of have a good 
idea of what we're looking for for commercial structures, large scale structures, um, service area and drive throughs, parking lots, all that has been added and adjusted. Then we also added some not acceptable uh, characteristics for building designs. Um, that's pretty much it. Let's see. There's a lot of pictures. Um, awnings. Um, just kind of like what the what the town's looking for for the awnings and canopies, um, signage. There's more stuff for the signs. Um, what's acceptable? What's not acceptable? Um, yeah, and that's it. Unless I'm missing anything, James. Is there anything else? No. Um, just the uh, we had a version sent out. Friday, based off the meeting we had Thursday, um, received some comments, and our attorney has reviewed it as well, and starting to make some changes based off of legal. Um, so that's why you see some changes, and it will continue to be reviewed by legal to be finalized for the August 15th meeting. So right now, Thank you very much for the presentation. Appreciate it. Um, so it's been presented to us. I imagine we're going to have a meeting about it, and then we have to have a public hearing about it before we actually put it on to the ballot, or no? No, the public hearing's after it's on the ballot. Okay. Okay. Um, I think you're all set. Nice. Thank you. All right. So, um... Are we supposed to take a vote on this today, or are we still have a meeting about this in the future? The one, the one thing that I'll point out as a thing that I see is unresolved. Um, there's some back and forth about potentially having the convenience store size range from 2,500 square feet, and if it's more, it needs further planning board review. Um, our legal recommended just putting in a minimum size, um, and again the. The discussion on size, a minimum, uh, maximum size. Yeah, mm -hmm. maximum size. Um, so discussions were anywhere between twenty five hundred square feet to five thousand square feet. Um, anything over three thousand square feet does require a higher level of planning board review through site plan review. So it does have that natural. You know, anything bigger than that requires site plan review, but. Um, is there any desire to see the, I mean, is there any preference on what the... Well, during, during the meeting on Thursday, you know, when we talked about this, um, I thought that um, it was brought up that was a state, had a standard of the 2,500 feet? Was that... That was just the average. That was the average, okay. Um, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't have a problem with the 3,000 square feet, you know, if it, I, I think anything like this you no know, should have a site review on it anyway. So is if three thousand square feet you no know, triggers a site review, I'm all for that. For the record, the uh, Cumberland Farms they said was uh, measured out to be twenty seven hundred. So and that's very decent in size. Um the only thing that I wanted to get any clarity on is uh we had discussed the uh the EV option, petroleum and EV. Um, this uh, version says petroleum and EV charging stations are considered gas stations, uh, automotive convenience stores. Should that not be or? I mean, it, we don't have standards for EV charging stations yet. So they're basically being classified as, as gas stations until we create those ordinances. But until then, shouldn't it just be uh, petroleum or EV charging stations? Yep. And or. No. Yeah, and or. I mean, it could have both, or it could have either. Yeah, but yeah, if we a... have and, we're it, by by the ordinance, we're making them have both. Yeah, that's something that we talked about in Thursday's meeting about you no know, 
is requiring requiring them to install the EV charging stations. And you know, as I pointed out, then is I think I think you're going to be seeing more businesses start putting those in. Is I don't know if we necessarily have to you know mandate that we put it in an automotive convenience store. It'd be nice. But, but we had that discussion also about is if it's just an EV charging station, then you know it doesn't meet all the other requirements. You don't have fuel pumps, you don't have tanks and things like that. So well, it also brings to mind that if you in in Saco, and they have a, the 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 McDonald the Plaza, the Shaw's Plaza next to McDonald's, they just have a bunch of charging stations in that plaza, like as like parking state. You know, just come in, park, charge, leave. You know. Uh, if someone wanted to do that in, you know, in Berwick, you know, would it be considered a gas station? If someone just wanted to add some EV charging stations to their parking lot, would it be become? Would it would it, would it turn their otherwise normal business into a automotive convenience store? So it might be something to to clarify the language on I can, at least. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We certainly don't want to force people to go EV, but we also don't want to limit people's ability to go EV. Okay. No, there's been some question about you no know, why we need this now. Um, I think it was back in the beginning of March when it was first brought forward. Um, a rumor, a story of a possible gas station going on in Route Four, which started all this. And a lot of work has gone into this over the last few months. Um, and, <clears throat> and rather than you no, know, just you know, prohibit a gas station from going in, I think this is a much better way of going about it, is making sure that if something were to go in, we have it in place so that people will know ahead of time what we're looking for. So. Um, I, I think I think this is a, a good addition to the land use ordinance. I, I agree, um, mainly because I don't. Well, I you know I hate being reactive. I want to be proactive. I don't want to wait for a gas station to go in and then have to worry about all the things that we didn't get under the you know uh, under the land use ordinance when we can do it now and hopefully head off any problems that might come in the future. So, James, are we looking for a vote, or are we doing a meeting to discuss no, this more? In I don't believe so. Anything that you want to see in the final version, now would be the time to, I mean, if you think of anything in the meantime, there's just, uh, sometimes this week would be preferable. Just let me know. Um, and then but will... otherwise, it's still under legal review, and you'll have a final draft in front of you for the next meeting. And then at that meeting, we'll either approve or reject it. If it's approved, we'll go to the ballot. We'll have a public hearing about it. It'll go to the ballot whether you guys recommend it or not. Okay. So you'll either recommend a yes or a no vote for the ballot. Got it. Yep. Okay. I want to comment on the design standards also. You know, this is building on something that's been in place for the downtown district for, what, five years now mm -hmm. or so? Yep. Is, um, and basically what we're doing is saying that, you know, we have these designs that we want to see downtown here, and this is just bringing it forward so any other developers that come in will see that we want not just the downtown but other parts of Berwick to, to not look like Danvers and Peabody Route 1 down in Massachusetts where all you have a uh, flat roof, single story, you know, fast food, convenience stores, <clears> gas <throat> stations. And, you know, we want something a little bit better than that for Berwick. And I think this is a good place to start with that. To maintain our rustic charm, as I, it were. I mean, Tom, I agree with you. We don't want the, the city development. Although I do find this pretty restrictive. If you're a developer and you're coming in, some of the guidelines, and I mean in general, not just the gas station, are pretty restrictive. You can't have a roof this size. You can't, what if it's your neighbor? And a lot of it is based on particular opinion. Whoever's sitting on the board, planning board 
at that particular year. Because a lot of things that you say in here is can't influence the neighbor, can't bother the neighbor. Well, who makes that decision? Yep. Who, who says that today your light is okay, but then five years from now someone else buys that house and they come to the planning board and say, well, it says here, it's not really clear. It just says, you know, if it's disruptive to the neighbor. Well, who determines that... who's, whether it's disruptive to the neighbor or not? That's pretty, that's pretty big. Well, at some point, a person is, it has to make the determination because, you know, we can, it, the, the, the more stringent we make the standards, the, you know, the harder it is to Oh, apply. I think the standards mm -hmm. are, are pretty stringent to begin no, with. No, I, I, I mean, just... like, if, if, if we don't have a person behind them actually making the final determination, then we have to come down to, like, the final minutia of everything. Like, this goes from being a three-page amendment to being a 25-page amendment because we have to quantify everything down to the last I'm not detail. saying quantify it. I'm yeah. saying that you shouldn't have something in there that is specifically based on the opinion of a neighbor because that neighbor can change at any time. Well, the neighbor doesn't determine it. The, the planning board, the code enforcement. Well, it says here that it have no show light that... Where was it? I think I put an X by it. Who determines? Uh, avoid disability glare, avoid being a hazard or nuisance to motorist pedestrians or neighboring residents is one of them. And I saw it again somewhere else. It's who determines that? If, yeah, go ahead. So that would be a code enforcement officer issue. Um, but like what you're saying with the signs, <clears throat> if a sign was approved by us, by the planning board, and five years later someone else buys it, that sign would still be okay. The only change would be is if they were to update that sign. It would just have to be updated with our land use ordinance if, if it's changed at that point. Right, and, and understand why I would think they'd be grandfathered in. Yeah. I'm a business, I'm coming in, I'm gonna move right next to your house. I meet all the other regulations, I got my sign up and everything, and the neighbor says, I don't want that business there. That glare, that light's bothering me. I'm gonna tell you that before you even go to the planning board, I'm going to put a stop to this. Well, they we, we've had this issue in the past because, right. I mean, we had the the marijuana grow operations That's exactly out what I was on 236. Mm -hmm. One of the regulations is uh, about smell. You know, mm -hmm. the smell is entirely subjective. That's it. That's you're, you're right. Subjective. So the neighbors say it smells. It smells all the time, and we send down code enforcement, and they go. It doesn't smell to me. You know, I don't, I don't smell anything. It smells pretty normal. You know, it comes down to code enforcement and what the average person would perceive. You know, if one person says, I don't want this light in my neighborhood, code enforcement goes out and says, well, they meet all the regulations. They're not breaking any rules. You can still consider it a nuisance, and it's still not in violation of the code, as long as the reasonable people on the board and code enforcement agree. The, this, I, I can check with legal to strengthen it or to strike it because A and C, if A and C are met, then B is kind of doesn't need to be irrelevant. There. Right, yeah. right. That's what I'm saying. I it's, mean, if it meets the angle and it's shielded properly, then there wouldn't be a. That's a specific restriction that you can follow, measure, as opposed to something that is subjective. And again, the one, the one thing I brought up in, in the workshop, uh, going back to the design guide and standard ordinance, and, and again, I love everything that's in there, um, and it kind of piggybacks what Lynn was bringing up now, is I love the recommended. I don't know if I am strongly for the not acceptable stuff that's listed in there. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, there's a lot of not acceptable, not acceptable, and I think that's where you limit somebody where you could just recommend what you want. And again, it comes down to the planning board enforcing that anyways. Um, but we're already I'm doing not. that in the downtown area. No, we're already doing those regulations in the downtown area. All we're right. doing is expanding them into other areas of the town. We're already saying that, no, these are the roof lines we want. These are the awnings we want. These are the windows we want. Correct. Yeah. But if we're going to put it into a law, then into the LUO as it, that's where I'm like, that not acceptable just says, you know, just saying this isn't going to be accepted. And again, we can influence and say this is what we want. You know, I just think it's, and again, I'm not 
swayed super hard one way or another. It's just something that stood out to me when I looked at it before last week. It's something I brought up last week and something that's here. How um, would you, how would you, well. I would just is, leave recommended. Well, the whole, yeah. the whole <laughs> point is that this is already a recommendation. Correct. Like, right now, as it stands, the design guide is a recommendation. It is basically like, here's what the planning board is looking for, and you can take it. Uh, but you could also ignore it completely and still try to get everything passed. And It's just Correct. a recommendation. It has no, uh, well, as Mike said, uh, no teeth. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, you know, you can still have, you still present it as absurd and ridiculous as you want to, you know. Which, but the planning board is still going to follow The planning board is still going to be the final say anyway. So, yeah. I, again, like I said, that's well, not, well, that's I mean, not going to sway me one way or another no, on what this. What I'm saying there. is, it's like, if, that, we, if the whole point of this is to accept it as part of the land use ordinance. If if the terms recommended, not acceptable, or as a concept doesn't work for you, what's the alternative? To not have it be part of the land use ordinance at all and just keep it as a guide? Or to change the wording to strike out not acceptable and just have the recommended? That's that's kind of where I was leaning. Okay. You know, that that would be my one thing. But again, I'm not hard put on it one way or another. It's not gonna you know, leaving it in there is not gonna deter me from saying, Hey, I like this and I think it should be part of the L U L. It's just something is that I would caution that I just think leaving the recommended in there and maybe striking the not acceptable because who knows what changes and some of the not acceptable again could be a little subjective when we look at what's there or it's a hard limit and maybe something 10 years from now comes into that's not acceptable now hey this is some actually something that we like or this is what is in there um but again i'm not hard put, i'm not hard put no, one no, way or no, the no, other I, you I, know I, it was just it was just a watch out that kind of I, kind of stuck out in I, I i i understand what you're saying i i as an example i there's this doctor and he's he trying to define like what the best kind of diet is and he can't respond to every new diet that comes yep. out because there's you know a thousand a day that come out you can't respond to every single one so you have to make guidelines of what does make a good diet as opposed yep. to and you know what makes it a you know instead of responding to every new possible because you're right there's essentially an infinite amount of permutations <laughs> that would be considered not acceptable, not acceptable right? yeah. So having that as a as a predetermined thing is a little. I mean, it, it just doesn't cover all the bases because we don't know what's going to come around the corner. And that was pretty much my point. Yeah. And again, it's not not swaying me one way or another. It just something that kind of just stuck out. And you just look at the differences between McDonald's when we were kids and McDonald's today. You know, <laughs> yeah. who would have ever thought that that's what that would transform into? <laughs> Can't predict the future. James, has the uh, lawyer looked at the acceptable, not acceptable definitions in the design guide? They have. I mean, if you want to, because this could be not recommended if that's if that's what the board prefers. And I believe the intent can still remain if an application comes in and they do not meet this as an, or, as an ordinance, if they're still, if they're going ahead and, and blowing through the not recommended, that there would be enough teeth to negotiate or deny an application until it comes into somewhat, some, some compliance. I mean, it, it would, if it doesn't meet, not, if it meets, or it doesn't meet one not acceptable, but it meets everything else, the board still can have, you know, some ability to, to approve it. It does have that flexibility. So would the terms preferred and not recommended be more more reasonable? Overall, this, this, this provides a supplement to the existing performance standards, that the performance standards says that you know, the, the new developments need to have respect to the bulk and size and um, the character. The character. Of the the performance standards are the hard draw yeah. line anyways. And right? this so, gives yeah. the images to what their, you know, the performance standards. So I think saying recommended, not recommended, or preferred, not recommended, um, I can run that by our attorney. And, yeah. So this is for anything moving forward. It wouldn't be for anything that's already Everything already existing. in is already grandfathered in. Yeah. And, well, technically, anything that's approved before the November vote would still be, would still be, would still be, not uh, this would not be applicable to it. so let me ask you this the new 
the new edge over here, these new facilities where the the butcher shop is and all of that. Would that be recommended under this? I think yeah, they've already used a lot of this. Yeah, I think already these are these. Well, because I'm looking at the <laughs> not acceptable straights here, and it looks very similar to what we have <laughs> across the street. So I'm just wondering, did it pass? <laughs> Linda. It would. <laughs> Okay, because uh, page 10, I'm looking at two buildings that, you know, have multiple businesses in one building with glass out front. But that's because that is an existing building that they rehabbed. It's not a new building. It was, you know, it's, that, that's part of the difference is, is um, where it was an existing structure that they were rehabbing. Yeah. So this is applicable only to new buildings coming in, not to any... If somebody wanted to buy a building like this on Route 4, this wouldn't apply to them because the building already exists. Essentially, yes. That would be my take on it. If, yeah. the building, if the building's already built in there, then, I mean, yes. We can't, we can't be like, well, you have a new owner, yeah, so now you have to tear it down and rebuild it. No, I'm, I'm asking because, I mean, yeah. this is pretty restrictive. I, I don't want to discourage people from coming in. We do have a lot of empty buildings from coming in and revitalizing some of those buildings yeah. and putting businesses in them. But then again, is is we want the businesses to come in, but... As I said, I don't want it to look like Route 1 down in Peabody, Mass, either. Well, you can limit that by the number of buildings, but I, you know, we want we want to encourage people to come in and, and for economic development. Um, and then it says here, only on Route 4, 236, and Route 9. So if I wanted to, you know, on that back road that goes to the, goes to the school, on Cranberry Meadow, if I wanted to put up a, a convenience store there, these wouldn't apply? Because it um, wouldn't be the front of the building wouldn't fit it, any one of those. It, well, a convenience store wouldn't be allowed in Cranberry Meadow Road because of the zoning ordinance. No, they are. It would be... They are. Village yeah. convenience store be, is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Village convenience store is allowed a under a condition. A neighborhood <laughs> store, Correct. not a convenience store. Correct. It would be considered a family grocery or something yep. like that. Yeah. So they could put that in and these rules wouldn't apply to them. Correct. Um, but they would still have other standards that they would have to meet that are in the That ordinance. is correct. The standards and guidelines is only for the Village Overlay District, Route 4, 236, and Route 9. Why? Because those are the more industrial roads Com that industrial, we have. commercial. That's where most of our commercial and industrial zones are. And in terms of the other areas, a lot of it is... R2, R3. Yeah. Right. If they want to put a business out there, which I don't recommend, but they could, <laughs> um, it would have it would be it'd still be conditional it's under the conditional. under the planning board that's up to approve the design and everything like that. And mm -hmm. it would still have to be in compliance with the neighbors around it, you know, couldn't be some monstrous thing in the middle of a neighborhood <laughs> because that, we already have that as an ordinance. It couldn't be right. it couldn't be some bright beacon of light or you know that spills onto three other farms in the area. Mm -hmm. or, you know, yeah, you know, we already have in the ordinance that you know things have to be compatible with the neighborhood, correct? Yep. So right. So you couldn't put a Walmart in R three. Well, no, <laughs> of course not. But um, the other thing here on H, it says uh, parking parking standards portion that. Store shall not provide any more parking spaces than required under Article 7, Section 7.8 of the Parking Standards. Shall not provide any more parking spaces. So if I own a bigger lot, I can't add more parking? If the lot's already there, then you're fine. But I'm saying, say I buy a piece of property on Route 4, and I put a building within the guidelines of all of this, and I measure it out and I want to put 12 parking spaces. But th this only applies to the automotive and the gas station. Right. So Say it's, it's um, convenience. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm so putting if, that if, up, and I and I have, I got eight acres. I'm going to put a small building out front, maybe a Napa or something. And you're saying that, I just don't understand the reasoning behind limiting the number of parking spaces. Because we don't want huge amounts of impervious That's surface correct. areas. For we have guidelines for parking lots. And things like that. That, that just we, references through the... The ordinance that it has to go by those guidelines. Right. Those, those ordinances are already in the yep. land use ordinance. And the parking ordinances, I believe they're proportional to the size of the building. Yes. So and if you want to have more parking, yeah. you, you can have more parking. Your building has to reflect that. 
Right. If you're putting a tiny little, you know, hut out there as your as your storefront, you can't have it surrounded by 36 parking spaces. You, you need to have an appropriate amount of parking spaces for the size of the building that you're putting up. And so if you have a factory or something like that, it depends on how many people work there, the square footage of the building and right. that type of thing. I'm thinking on 236, that new marijuana place. Silver? Yeah, the, the one just before the transfer station. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Silver, silver. Right. Yeah. I want to say there's got to be eight or nine spots in there. Yeah, it, it was whatever was allowed per the land use ordinance is what they have. Hmm. It's determined by the square footage of the business and the type of business, too. Right. You know, if you're having a you know, uh, convenience store where people are coming and going, coming and going, it's not the same as if you need long-term parking. It's one of the things we don't want is to end up with the parking lots like over at Walmart and Home Depot and places like that, that 95% of the time, 80% of the parking lot's empty and sitting there. And all you have is a huge expanse of impervious surface, you know, dealing with your runoff and your water and all that stuff. Right, and I, and I get that. That makes sense. You're talking about a large parking lot, but... You're talking about this. This is an automotive convenience store. So you have, what, one, two, maybe three employees? That's three spots. So now somebody's coming in. You know, it's a convenience store. You're coming in and out. Now you've limited them to, what, four parking spots for customers. Well, not exactly, because you have, if you, if the ordinance says that the, that the spots for fueling count as parking spaces. So if you have... You know, if you have, you know, uh, four pumps right. on each side, you have, you know, so you're talking about like eight spaces right there, just right from, from those spots for customers. For the gas pumps? Yeah. Well, the gas pumps count as parking spaces. What if it was like triaxles or dump trucks or something like that? Would they have different spots for them? I don't think so. I think they have the, I think. They're park, one of the. I think a parking It's not going to fit in the same space. spot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so with the parking lot standards it's it's for everyday uh, passenger vehicles it's um if you go to cumberland farms there's no real designated parking for those big commercial vehicles um like if a refueling truck came up there's no they'd park near the tanks well they don't um, have a, as big of an area either i mean right well they're at 2700 square feet so what it's 300 up to 300 square feet difference i mean that's I, I guess i don't really know what the question is at that point are those trucks going to be able to get gas there and park oh yeah oh yeah definitely. It'll, be, it'll be wide enough oh, yeah. for them it'll be, so ex that area, it'll be accessible oh yeah that the, area so that's the, one spot well the it's islands, probably two it, it's for all a regular relative car. yeah they would take up two spots on the island just like at cumberland farms they would take up that one pump, and then if their trailer is behind it, they'd probably take up the room on the next pump. I have another question. <clears throat> on number four, accessory dwelling unit, I'm just asking this question. The, okay, we've changed, we want to change from 400 to 190. Are there, I know that's a state, what the state has allowed. Does the state have any other regulations that we haven't put on here? I'm unsure. You're not sure? I'm unsure on that. If okay. the state does have other requirements, then yeah. they're automatically in place for okay. us. They, they supersede our ordinances anyway. Mm -hmm. One of the things um, we had heard was that they add a lot of sheds. So if you put 190 square feet, you know, a little uh, house, and then you how, is there can you add as many sheds as you want? There's an ordinance for sheds. Is there? Yeah. How many can you have? I want to say it's like one or two. Okay. Up, off the top of my head, it's kind of. I'm just. But it's a. I, I think it's a matter of square footage on that. Okay. It also yeah. depends on your lot size if you can actually fit it because right. sheds can't be like right on the property lines either. Right. right. Like okay. if you're trying to throw if you're trying to throw a um, shipping container out, you're only allowed one, and then you have to get conditional use for the others if if you're trying to get more than that. That was just one of the things that was mentioned the other night, is that they add a lot of sheds. That, that's the only reason I'm mentioning it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I recently asked Irish about, you know, if there was a minimum size to a shed that you need a building permit, and she said no. 
know, no matter how small it is, you still need to get a building permit and meet all the requirements and setbacks. And, and, all right. and, and people aren't supposed to be living in sheds either. That doesn't count towards an accessory dwelling unit. Just keep that in mind, too. <laughs> well, 190 square feet, they're going to be put something. Well, that's an accessory <laughs> dwelling unit, though. It's, I mean, I've seen tiny houses that are smaller than that. Yeah. I mean, they don't need much. But they don't, They also have to conform to having uh, septic and Same water. Condition. You're right. Yeah. Where the smaller ones usually don't. Under the marijuana cooperative... What's the reasoning behind moving it from two to three if it's a private home, private residency? So the state allows um, two people in a house to do it. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're stricter than that. So we are changing that to be up with state standards. They allow two, and this says that you're moving it to three. So this is for the term marijuana cooperative. Right. So the definition of cooperative is three or more. Yep. Where with the town, before this, it was two or more, so you could only have one at a house. Now okay. this makes it so we're allowing two to a house. So if, under our current standards, you and your partner can't both share a unit, share, share a dwelling, and do this because you'd be considered a cooperative. Right, and right. cooperatives allowed aren't allowed. So under this new uh, amendment, you and your partner would be able to, and there's no third person can come in. That's correct. Yeah. So, father, sons, mom, daughters, Probably partners. Yeah. yeah. So they can both have. They can both. They can both have uh, well, in the same residence and be yes. in the same residence. So that's twice as much, groups in the same home. Yep. Yep. Yes. I just have a question on solar. How do you know the lifespan of a solar panel? Just a, just wondering. I believe it's 20, 25 years. That's, that's, so that's, that's the, the not current. newer ones. They're talking about thirty years yeah. or more. Yeah. And so that's why we have the um, the decommissioning section in here, as that's been like brought as a concern that's been brought up in the past. Yeah. Because people are going to build solar farms and just use them for 20 years and then just leave. Yeah, just abandon right. them where they are. How many do we have now, solar farms? We have two built, two approved, and one that was a smaller one that was in front of planning board. And they, tabled they tabled it, it from there. So. And one of them's waiting for capacity. Uh, actually, both of them are they waiting for capacity. Mm -hmm. the, the two not built. <clears throat> and that, I just want to talk about that. Is, you know, we talked about one of the things we talked about was having a, a putting a cap on the number of solar facilities in in Berwick. And right now, is from what I understand, is Central Maine Power doesn't have the capabilities of adding any more on, and that's why you know we need that they would need that capacity letter from CMP before they could get approved. So that is the cap we have right now. Yeah. And it would cost you know, uh, uh, somebody probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to upgrade any line. So we basically, we do have a cap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I, I've argued before about the caps. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of putting caps on it. As, um, I don't think it's, going to be that big a problem, mostly because is any valuable land that is available for it is being bought up and made into house lots anyways. So, is personally, I would rather see the solar farms than the house lots. Well, that's my opinion. Any other questions for Mike at this time? No. I'm I was sure. trying to think of one just to get him to have to walk back off the podium. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we will have much more discussion and, you know, wording changes and things like that before everything is 100% finalized. Uh, thank you for take, for presenting and taking all the questions. Thank you. It's very helpful, and I'm sure we will see you again shortly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, moving on, right? Um, we have no unfinished business at this time. 
we have town manager report. Okay. I'm going to wrap my documents real quick. One moment here. I have a lot of Here we go. Glad I found it. Okay. <laughs> tax commitment will be next meeting, August 15th. It's when we set our tax rate. Um, don't want to curse it, but I might be cursing. I think numbers look pretty good. So numbers will be finalized. We have that for the next meeting. Uh, our personnel policy was revamped. Uh, we went through the whole document with HR consultant Betsy Olton and the documents being reviewed by our attorney now and once it finishes review it'll be in front of the board for your your review um, working on another addition to the transfer station fee schedule and i'll have that in front of you for the next meeting uh, we're talking about yard brush other municipalities charge for it it's a, it's a major expense for the transfer station um, looking at maybe 10 or 15 bucks um, just to recover some cost. Again, that's yard yard debris. Um, and again, it's we have do set come and pick it up and it's it's expensive. Um, just as a note, we had a request to for the town to adopt Chandler's way. Um, that's off of Knox lane uh, the road was recently paved and we have some engineering reports jody's looked at it so the intent is to have that on for the november ballot is it a cul-de-sac it is a cul-de-sac it is a cul-de-sac cul uh, the question is about um with, with the way the ordinance is written is that if it was a subdivision that was approved before 2019 and is considered active and the discussions with with planning is if it's considered act with uh, SMPDC about it being considered active, but has a vacant lot on it. Also, we had a construction escrow going back many years as well. So I would recommend to consider it still active and applicable to be uh, adopted by the town. But that's obviously up to voters, well, the board to recommend it, and the voters. The um, two houses that are on Knox that are not part of the town because the Knox ends at Tiffany Lane, would that also be part of that adoption? It'd be the segment from Knox. So all the way from Tiffany Lane down to yeah. Chandler's Way. Just looking for Who pays for it now? It's maintained, it's privately, maintained. privately. Oh. It was... you, know, you, you, say, you say it's active because there's an open lot on it? Is uh, that that's the open lot that they've been holding as an access into the back land, correct? Correct. Because no, we we looked at the town looked at that piece of property at one time when we were looking at doing the fire station out off of Pine Hill, and uh, we talked to that owner, and is, I believe that that one lot that's not built on is they've kept that open because it's an access into the back. Of the rest of the lot, you know, that they have plans on uh, possibly uh, developing in the future. Um, you know, I, I was one of the ones that pushed through the uh, no longer taking on cul-de-sacs and private roads and things. And uh, I, I, I still, I want to, I'll hold, I'm going to hold to my guns on, on that. Is that I'm going to recommend we not take it, you know, because is. <clears throat> We cost the town more money than we get out of it. So, like I said, that's my personal take on it. You get a lot of money out of Fox Ridge, and it's not done there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fox Ridge is different because it actually, all the roads intersect with each other. You can go from one Hold side on. to the other side. To the, right, it's not a cold side. Before, yeah. before you guys keep talking about it, I'm going to accuse myself. Of this it's no, we'll have to have a discussion about it later. But yeah, Fox Ridge is just is all straight lines. You can cut right through it. But the cul-de-sacs are different. You know, you have to go down them. You can't come back through them. And it's awesome. Actually, this one you can. It's a full circle. We have a full circle at the end. Yeah. Which one? 
Links. Links. Okay. Well, that's what a cul-de-sac is. <laughs> yeah. well, well, it's not the open circle. It's the around the island. So it's a straight street. Yes. So yeah, that's the the policy is just um, yeah. I I was in planning and definitely it's a great policy that you know if we're having a hard time maintaining the roads we already have, we shouldn't take any more roads until we at least catch up in our paving plan. Um, but again, yeah, that's that the definition is uh, anything like I said before 2019 considered active. So that question is. Probably a question for legal on what, you know, how, how do we put the hard line on what's considered active? Um, it should it really, literally be under construction? Um, and I checked with SMPDC. They had a couple they had different opinions on it, and I can check with our legal to hypothetically form, I mean, form answer. Even, even if we, let's say, let's say four of us say we don't, we don't, we don't recommend it, does it still go to the voters and they still make the final decision or does it die there? I have to look at the process. I mean, I, it, when in doubt, I always I mean, give it to the voters, let them make the decision. You know, if they want to spend the money to take care of it, then it's up to them. You know, it's not our, it's not our, it's not our money. <laughs> it's, it's the voters money. I'll have to double check what the formal process for the road adoption request is. No. Okay. Get back to it. Um, Last thing I have, we have a request um, to spend $500 for beautification out of the TIF funds. This is for the small triangle next to Spencer Matthews where the Legion put up their, their car sign area, that, that area. Mm. Um, had a couple of volunteers uh, spruce up the place a bit. There was an overgrown tree there that was removed. So um, they're asking for $400 to $500 to um, plant some perennials in there. And I just, this is Drew McCormick and they've been involved with some beautification downtown. And um, if we have volunteers willing to do the work, I think it's money well spent. Yeah, it's yeah. time to get rid of that shrubbery that's <laughs> overgrown and fallen into the road a few times. But uh... <clears throat> yeah, do you, need a, do you need a motion and a vote on that one? Yes. yes. Yep. So, so, yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the five hundred dollars out of the TIF fund for the beautification down at uh, the Triangle by Spencer Matthews. I'll second that. Any further discussion? What's uh, five hundred dollars? What are they putting down there? Perennials. There's a lot of perennials. Well, no. So they have to remove the shrubs and trees or whatever. They're there. I'm, I'm assuming the mulch and everything else that goes with it too. Yeah, um, a few things they donated. I'd like to pick up some plants from the greenhouse as well as a few bags of compost to jumpstart things. And that's up to 500. They don't have to spend all of up it, right? Up to 500, yep. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? <laughs> all those in favor? That completes my report. All right. All right, um, done. Site board communications. Um, we have an invitation to attend a, uh, essentially a municipal conference program um, in South Portland on September 14th. Um, we also all received invitations to go visit Nassau and take a tour around there um, as members of the community and see the good works that they do. Accounts payable. Where are we at here? All right. Payroll warrant number five from July 27th, 2023. The amount of $91,320.21. Payroll warrant number six from July 27th, 2023. In the amount of $1,933.66. Accounts payable warrant number seven from August 1st, 2023, in the amount of $905,890.62. I make the motion that we pay our bills. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? All right. 
all good there. That education one always gets hits hard, doesn't it? <laughs> all right. Um, new business. Lawn chairs. Special event permit request. Envision Berwick. Jeremy, go. <laughs> I choose you. <laughs> Hello, folks. Hello, uh, have you had a chance to look over this? Lawn Chairs is August 19th this year with a rain date of August 20th. Uh, we have a, a, a robust event that we're very excited about. We have a maker's market uh, out here on this side of uh, the Delta. Is that what calling it? On this side, we have uh, quite, quite a few um, of our uh, 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 town organizations, including the Legion, uh, the uh, 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 PTO um, library, all uh, all with booze, interactive booze, and uh, a lot of fun stuff happening. We um, also have bands and acts, as previously. Um, we are shutting down both both Sullivan and Rochester streets with the cooperation of police and fire. We've uh, been making this plan with them from the beginning. By not doing two dates this year, uh, it provided a lot more buy-in. So um, we feel really good about it. Raised a uh, terrific uh, amount of money from uh, from our partners, our sponsors. So we're grateful, and we think it's, as always, a really uh, our eyes on the prize of a community building project that brings us together, sets up civic pride, and gives us something to look forward to every year. That's that's Berwick's special event. I'm here to answer any questions. I have a couple for you. Sure. <laughs> All right. So, Rochester Street and Sullivan Street are going to be shut off from what point? The back of the town hall? Is that where the cutoff is going to yes, be? Yes. Yes, just past owner. Okay. Um, and obviously, the rest is the before the intersection. Yes. Yes. And they, 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 there was quite a bit of, of um, energy put into the, the plan for how everything would be rerouted in the most intelligent and useful way so that, you know, again, this isn't stuff, we didn't go to them and propose, this is how we'd do it. Obviously, we, we relied on the expertise of, of, you know, our police and fire to, to tell us what they believed was going to be the way to most effectively make this possible. Where is going to be most of the parking located? We're going to... Really good question. Um, we let me say that I think we are going to be able to use at least for our vendors and our acts and everybody who's volunteering the lot across the street. Um, we've been in touch with those folks, and because now that's that is available, that will open that up for for everybody who's working the event. In which case. The lot over here becomes open for for additional parking, and we would also use the lot across the street for handicap parking, so that anybody can park even closer to these handicap parking, and then we just let them through. The um, the beer garden they don't need a special permit for that because they're still selling on the property. It is right? well, so the, because it is uh, attached to the property, that's how this works, and and we we have worked. With I forget the bureau, the state bureau, but we work with them every year to set this up, and we work hand in hand, obviously, with Corner Point to make this happen. But because you open the door to Corner Point and the beer garden is right there, it makes it it makes it very doable. Obviously, were they if if Corner Point was not interested in doing this, we would come up with a different plan, but it would require more infrastructure. This mm. this makes it very easy. So, question on the handicap. So, how is the if this is closed from here and here, and you're saying the parking over here is going to be the handicap? How do they access it? Can you use the back way in yet? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. They're going to use the, the, the back. Please, oh. would let them through. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And you're going to have signage and everything moving people. Absolutely. Okay. And and officers station. Okay. I imagine we're, you're paying for the overtime and such. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know what? I, I think the visibility, honestly, to have 
you know, fire trucks there to have have yeah. you know we, we our, our our public works trucks are going to be used to, to block streets and I think that that and I see that in summers worth of festivals to have that visibility where 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 our officers and our fire department and our, our public works vehicles are there that's great stuff and it gives people an opportunity to, to interact with you know people who work and are part of our town and I think that 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 becomes more important as the event becomes part of the DNA of Berwick. Because that that's how this stuff works. In my opinion, in order to have um, good vibes, for lack of a better term, between sort of the citizens and 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 employees and, and people who are part of the town in that way, um, that visibility is really, really it's important. And like last year we put it together with with the uh, police department to last minute, and we had to, we, we we were hiring officers from from other towns, which was great. But I'm really glad this year we were able to to put it in front of them early enough to get our officers, you know, here during the summer. Which obviously it's it's a tough time, but I think it's I think it's important, and I think it's really good. I'm really happy about that. Another question. So you're saying the fire truck and. A town police vehicle is going to be somewhere stationed down here. The reason why I'm thinking that is there is there going to be a general. What happens if August 19th turns out to be 100 degrees? Is there going to be like a first aid station somewhere around here because the roads are blocked off? Well, so people everything can't drive will down. be so. Were there to be an emergency? Obviously, this is the right. very first thing that was considered. Is how do emergency vehicles get through? So because we don't want to block somebody's ability to get in, from in an ambulance to a hospital, right? right. But in addition to that, and that, that has been part of the planning and consideration at the beginning, as I understand it, we actually have an ambulance stationed at the event now as well. Okay. So, you know, if somebody were to get a heat stroke or something like that, we have an EMT on site at the event. Yeah, that was actually going to be my question Linda brought up because I was going to say it looks like even though Rochester Street's closed off, we still left the beer garden, the tents, everything off to the side. It looks like there's still that emergency access yes. lane coming right down the street. Right. And I'm not saying that necessarily you need to pull an ambulance in there, but you start to get... Some of our seniors there start to feel too much heat or whatnot. Is there a designated sign or, you know? What we, we last the year, open, what we'll yeah. do again this year is the lobby becomes our go-to air-conditioned space okay. for okay. seniors. And, and you know, part of what we're talking to volunteers about this time, because we, we're actually expanding our volunteer pool this year, which I'm Ooh. thrilled about, <laughs> is keeping an eye on those folks and, and knowing, you know, how, how to say... You know, you look warm. Why don't you come on into the lobby with me and let's cool off and get your drink or whatever, so that we, okay. you know, uh, again, based on based on the weather of this summer, <laughs> may not be an issue. Not be an issue yeah. But it's you always good to have our eyes on those. Situations. Right? Yeah. You might need umbrellas. <laughs> umbrellas are always a good choice. Any other questions for Jeremy? Oh, I think it looks good. I make a motion to approve the special event permit. I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? So, it, like last year, after the event's over, I want you to come back, tell us all the good work <laughs> you did, in case any of us missed it. I want you to come back, let everybody know how good it was, and where you can improve, and what, what plans are for next year. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. I already got some big ideas for next year. <laughs> and I will ask... If if any of you were not there last year, have you watched the the video that sort of represents? But you know, I think you get a good taste of of what we did and what what, what the spirit is, and, and you know, we just want to expand it. We're, we're really making an effort this year to um, to draw a crowd for our vendors, and I think that um, you know we'll see what happens. There's always going to be room for improvement, but finding a way to make this work. For people to say, I vended it at Bring Your Lawn Chairs to Sullivan Square, and I sold out by halfway through or whatever. That's the goal, you know? I, I just want to add that, you know, this is the th third year that they've done this. Um, it gets better every year. Yep. But yep. is the amount of time that the volunteers, the Vision Berwick and the volunteers put into this is incredible. They started planning this almost immediately. I was going to say, it was like a week after last year. year. <laughs> and... Uh, it, 
you know, the, like I said, the amount of time that these people put into it to pull this off is just amazing. And, and I just want to you know, make sure that your public be thanked. That well, it's it's there are there. Thank you for saying so. And and you know, I'm I'm the face in front of you talking about it. But there are a handful of people that that make this happen. And and yeah, without I'd say five them, of you guys, yeah. you know, carry the biggest load. Absolutely, so. incredible. All right. Well, we'll see you shortly then. Thank you. Do I have a moment for um, to put on a different hat as a citizen and just just uh, uh, ask a question and throw something out, public comment wise? You can wait till the second public comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can't get through the other things. We, we will be much longer with yep. this part. Okay. Yeah. All right. We have a poll permit from CMP. This is a request to add a poll on the corner of Little River Road and Birchcroft. To service a new house. That's the existing pool. I've often asked, what happens if we say no? <laughs> <laughs> and those people just don't get, get power. Get a generator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion that uh, we uh, <clears throat> give the poll permit for the poll at the corner of uh, Birchcroft and Little River Road. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? New poll. All right. Um, no quick claim deeds, no abatements. Um, I'm going to move up other business and non agenda items. <coughs> we have a uh, alcohol uh, permit. It's an application for license for an incorporated civic organization. James, what? This is a, a Venn request for, uh, it's like a mobile um, bartender service. Uh, this is for an event um, at the uh, Dunn Farm event venue for August 12th. Uh, they're doing a cornhole tournament and <laughs> serving drinks by a licensed and insured bartender. Mm. So it's similar, they've, um, they've, had, they've had an event before the board before, and this is just for this, this uh, New cornhole event. It appears to be a charity event. Um, just need your approval so the state can grant their license. I make the motion that we approve the one day uh, license uh, for the Lions Cornhole for the Cure. A second. Any further discussion? So uh, it says here that, <clears throat> will dancing be part of the event? No. No. <laughs> what happens if they violate the <laughs> Well, according to this right here, there is a $2,000 penalty <laughs> if they don't they violate the, the rules. We'll make them donate the penalty to the charity. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that charity will go to fund really quick, I'll tell you. Especially if it's for each violation. <laughs> Two people together, that's $4,000. Yeah, all right. Um, all those in favor? Approved. All right. Any other business not agenda items that anybody wants to mention? Going backwards. Second public comment. <laughs> State your name and address, please. Jeremy Caston, 310 Blackberry Hill Road. Um, I just wanted to uh, clarify and, and make sure um, that I kind of took a moment to, to say this because um, I think... Uh, most of you, Linda, I know you weren't there at the um, conjoined meeting or whatever the other night. Oh, I, no, but I watched the I'm video. sure you did. Yeah, and so I, I just wanted to touch on it. I'm sure you're aware that for the last several years I've been checking in, trying to educate myself with the planning board um, and get up to speed a little bit as a citizen and also just as a you know member of the community who cares about the direction Berwick may go in and have seen um, pressures, development pressures, in other places change the town, the tenor of towns very quickly. Um, and so, uh, in large part, the effort with the, um, uh, um, um, don't know why I'm blanking, the, uh, the, the design, design standards, standards guide that, that is in front of you, uh, comes from that. And so I just wanted to be clear from, from from my perspective and also from you know other folks that sort of I worked with on this and and people that that 
where, where these discussions, where this was jesting, right? The idea of limiting people from bringing business is the opposite of what I think, not just the intention, but having read deeply into other towns' um, design standards and such. The idea of saying not just, here's what we like, here's hoping, is to prevent some giant corporation or someone who just doesn't care from showing up and, and presenting something to the town or pushing something through that quickly changes things in a way that is very difficult to attract. And, and as I was following the discussion earlier tonight, it sounded like that was exactly, and I just want to make sure I understand, exactly what you were getting at and that you were backing up is sort of this, like, well, if we can't cover everything, then what are we doing? Fear. And I just wanted to understand that because it goes back to something that, that I was talking about at the meeting the other night, which is that, that so much of what I've come to understand we are doing is reactionary to what we see in other places, what we see in Route 1 when you go to the go to the Logan and you see all over, all over America now, right? Where where corporations come in and they impose their sort of will on a town that didn't protect itself enough appropriately and found a loophole or said like, well, you didn't protect yourself this way, so now we're going to do this to you. Is is that I really worry that that there isn't we do not have rules, something in place from legal or planning or, 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 or someone that's protecting us from that eventuality because we can imagine, as you said earlier tonight, we can imagine every possibility and we're still not going to think of every one. So how do we protect ourselves from that? And, and I think it's, it's an important thing for us all to be thinking about because it will come. It, that it, there is an inevitability to this for all, all rural communities on the edge of town of cities, right? This is an important consideration, and, and I don't have an answer, but I think it's something that we, we need to be thinking about. And I just wanted to sort of posit that. I, I agree with you in the sense that, but I almost think the opposite in the sense that you say we shouldn't be driven by fear, but yet you're telling us that you're afraid that the big bad companies are going to come in, and so we should do everything to prevent now. I just worry that there needs to be that line somewhere that says, you're right. I don't want to see Walmart or a large corporation dropped in downtown Barwick either. But yet I don't want it to be so restrictive that any developer looking even to make small business investments looks at us and goes, yeah, they're so restrictive. They are so anti-business. I'm going to go. There's plenty of places that I can go and we're closing the door. And so there is that fine line of balance. Balance. Exactly. And and that's what we're trying to achieve in that. And and I agree with that because you're right, I don't want someone to sloop it in a, loop, a loophole either. But I just, and what I see is it's so restrictive, someone's going to just shake their head and go, why don't I just I'll go over to Elliot? Yeah, I'm gonna pop over to Elliot or North Carolina. Well, so Elliot's a great example. We don't allow what Elliot allows. We already have signage standards in Berwick that would not allow yep. that Dunkin' Donuts with a giant TV advertising their sales. And yep. so Elliot is a much more moneyed town, and we can all agree there's their property there that 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 their you know their median income is a lot higher, and that they have a lot of property that's very very valuable. And what they've done is with great intentionality, it seems to me, said. This is our 236, let whatever happen, and we're not going to control that, and we're going to let that be an economic driver for what that is to protect everything over here. That's a choice, too. But there were definitely, in my opinion, having not been in those rooms, there were definitely meetings and rooms where people made those choices. And mm -hmm. what I am asking, as a citizen, that I want to be very clear, like separate and aside, although we talk about this a great deal within Envision Burbank, as a citizen, I'm just asking that, that all of us, citizens included, and really more than even the planning board and the select board, because you, it's a limited amount of time. People have to do their part. We need to think of, about what our plan is. 
We have to be intentional and make those plans. And if, if there are parts of town that we want, we do want a Walmart, we should make those decisions. But we have to make them and not let it happen to us. And that's, that's really... But that it, is what the planning board and the select board are for. You're basically saying, I mean, to me, my impression is, I don't want to... I don't want the planning board to be snowed over or the select board, so we're going to make this so restrict so they can't sneak in. And I think that we have, uh, I mean, I, we're kind of on the same page. I just think we need to, to, to maybe sharpen that balance up a little bit more. That's I all. think it bears a lot of discussion, and I think that there's not a lot of time, but we need to find the time to make, the, to make, to make these choices and decisions and discussions. Because when you don't, Stuff happens without intention. And a lot of what we're talking about with the design standards and what we want to see brought is a lot of that is being driven directly from the comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. Not just the comprehensive plan now, but the comprehensive plan that was before that and the comprehensive plan they're working on now. Is that has been laid out over the years and the vast majority of people have been polled and asked and everything, all come back is that we need to protect what we have in Berwick. Has the comprehensive yeah. plan ever gone out to the public for a vote? Yeah. 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 Yes. Every, every new plan is voted on. Every oh. new plan. Yeah. And, and, and the plans are informed by the public and they there's usually polls taken and public comments. We're right. just about to start another half, survey. Survey is going out last. this week mm -hmm. for agriculture yeah. for the comp plan because those surveys are, are exactly what it's written from. Learning from people what they believe is important. Right, and, 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 and I agree with you, but I mean, we're, we're upping the number of people who can have, uh, you know, we, we're saying that we're bringing in one type of business and we keep expanding that type of business, but yet we're putting restrictions on, you know, what if I wanted to open a craft store on Route 4 between North Park and South Berwick, you know, um, I've got to come here and say, well, I can't build what I want. I've got to come in here and build what the select board or the planning board tells me i got to build. Uh, and I'm not saying no, that it's we not want... The, it's not the select board or the planning board because it's all voted on by the town. It's what the town votes for. If, if the town says they don't want these design standards as a whole, then they'll tell us. They've told us no before. Okay. So if if the if the town, well, I mean, obviously this is all public record. People can go look at it. We can, it'll be public before the vote and everything like that. People can make a decision if they want those as high standards or not. And if they don't, then they won't pass. <laughs> right. And I I agree with putting recommendations, like you said, put recommendations out so we can steer the town in the direction we want. But there's a difference between recommendations and restrictions, or you cannot have By this. saying not acceptable, you're giving yourself an opportunity to have some teeth in it. Otherwise, it's just, it, it will be a document that, that people say, well, it says that's what you'd like, but it doesn't say I have to do that. And so you're trying to find a way, say, and, and at some point, you know, you could argue, does it come down to taste? If you look at what the design, what the design standards are, are, are positing, it's, it's stuff like, you know, a thousand foot wall with no windows like that's that in no world is that attractive except a modern art exhibit or something. you know what I mean like mm -hmm. I, I, I I also agree that the last thing that we want is to slow down economic progress in Berwick. I think it's really important to be really clear about that but none of these design standards are written from whole cloth they all come from neighboring towns that are economically viable and successful so that's why they, it seemed wise to look at what other towns do to protect themselves. And I do agree with that as well. I mean, obviously Portsmouth is not struggling to maintain their downtown <laughs> standards, you know, that they, and they have a very beautiful downtown that has strict design standards. So, but right Here, I'll play devil's advocate for a second. All the existing buildings. Uh, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate for a second. Portsmouth has a city council. Right. So <laughs> if... We put this to vote, and people look at this and say, I think that's too restrictive, and they tell us, no. <laughs> All that work Jeremy just did, yeah. not just Jeremy, but collectively, goes out the window. Mm -hmm. And that's where me looking at it to say, hey, that not acceptable was my watch out, again, doesn't sway me. Sure. But you got 3,100 registered voters that 
ten percent will ideally show up because they'll forget that there's an election. Um, but um, that you're putting that in the hands of, and and that's sometimes what we got to think about what that yep. that verb is. because I again we can always get it this way and then readjust if we need to. Yeah, you know, so no, that's I, I that's that. I just wanted to get out in front of it and but yeah, so it directly. No, no, correct, and and I, and I think you know because you said it the other night too with and and. and I think the opposite where you're like, oh, the, the fear of, oh, some lawyer is going to find the loophole. I don't think it's that. I think me, it's for me, at least to reassure you, because I absolutely agree. I want standards and, and, you know, I try to volunteer in the comp plan too and see that and preserve what we can. I think of it too is what are the residents in the town going to see on paper and feel fits them and not just the ones that are actively volunteering, but the ones that do get out that once, once a year and kind of, oh, we're voting on this. Oh, I don't really know about that. Yeah. And, and go the other way and, and put something presentable so that they understand. I so. think that's why it's also important to say that everything that already exists, reiterate already that whatever Correct. exists on 9, 2, 36, and 4 will, will always exist be, as they are, right? That they're grandfathered in. And so somebody who has a business, where nobody's going to show up and say, you have to put on a new roof because it doesn't follow the design standards. Correct. And, in and, fact, and what we're saying in the document in a lot of cases is, you need to look around at what's already there so that what you're building, your new construction, fits in with what's, what is currently there. Agreed. And, and we know it's in this room and Mike and you, you know, they, they know any, and we have the same planners that come ahead when something, you know, so they, they generally know, yes, it needs to fit that town. It needs to fit that neighborhood. It needs to fit those neighborhoods. I just, again, my caution is just what's that verbiage when it goes out to, you know, Sally who, doesn't know that yeah. we're already doing this. That, that's legitimate. That's, I, I, that's there. I understand that. So, and again, I'm on the same page with you too. I just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just I just try to walk that that ground sometimes to, to think both ways. Sometimes I have to take my hat off here to think about it. Not Absolutely. just my personal opinion on the other side, but what my neighbor thinks or down the street thinks. So. Did I answer your questions, Linda, as it relates to that? You answered my question. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Lisa? How's that? Okay, good. We'll, we'll be talking more shortly, I'm soon. <laughs> yes. I'm soon, I'm sure. Yep. Thank you for allowing me to uh, jump in on that. Of course. Not a problem. Do you have a, com a comment? <laughs> <laughs> they just do this. 263 Pine Hill Road. So one of our big examples of, we're not trying to limit who does stuff on the in the town. We're trying to limit what it looks like. So case in point is at Freeport McDonald's. That's great. That is not a normal McDonald's, mm -hmm. but it fits that area well. So if a big store wanted to come in here, great. We just want them to look a certain way that doesn't make them look like a big box store. If they add faux windows like at Hannaford's and North Berwick to break up the wall, that's, that's perfect. Stuff like that is what we're looking for. It's not like we're saying, no, Walmart can't be here. It's more or less... You can be here, but we just want you to look like you fit in the town, not just some big box that just is just sitting there. You know, that was like our whole what what our feedback from everyone that has come in into the planning board and kind of helped with this. That's been like the feedback that we've been giving. But you just said that in that thirty second thing was a better description than the impression I got from okay. this. Okay. And so when you take that out to the voters, yeah. you might want to, to say that. Okay. Okay, because what you because this seems very restrictive and we just don't want you here. Yeah. It's That's not, what it comes yeah, across. It's not as. that we don't want you here, it's we want you to fit within our guidelines to make our town look in better. our guidelines yeah. again are designed yeah. to come into the but that's Yeah. Again, when you get the, the general public who looks at this, right. they're going to say, right. geez, they don't want any businesses here. They're right. making it so restrictive. Right. And it's not. What you just said is it's not that they couldn't come here. Right. It's that if they're going to build a business here, it needs to be, you know, somewhat in confinement with the rest of the thing. But it's right. not that it's unwelcoming right. to new business. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> that was really good. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's for sure. All right, we have an executive session. So um, I will, we're not going to be making any votes in executive session, so we'll be coming Thanks, back Jeremy. out of it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so this will be effectively the end of the live portion of the meeting. Ready,
Anybody have anything else to add before we go offline? All right, I move that we go into executive session under Title 14056A for discussion of personnel. Second. Second that. Uh, all those in favor? Good night.